sake, amen. amen. We are in Jeremiah. Look, let's look at this together. I'm not going to read through. I'm just going to go into this. Jeremiah chapter 38. I'll give you a little backdrop about Jeremiah. I'm sure everybody here knows who Jeremiah is. Jeremiah actually is the second longest book in the Old Testament. And I know you might say, well, what about Isaiah? The Psalms is 150 chapters. Isaiah is 66 chapters. But Jeremiah is essentially the longest book in regards to words. You know, he says a whole lot. And I'm sure if I was a teenager and the Lord called me to ministry, I would have a lot to say too. You know, the Lord calls him to the ministry. Not only did the Lord call him to the ministry, but his life wasn't his life. You know, imagine your whole life is just whatever God has for you. And this was Jeremiah's life. You know, his whole life, you know, God said that even before he was born, he knew him. You know, and, and God had a plan for his life. And not only did he, have, did he have a plan for his life, his message was God's message. And he became the message of God. Wherever you seen, you know, Jeremiah, God was right there with him. You know, early on when you first read Jeremiah, you, when, you know, he says that the Lord said, Before I formed you uh, in the womb, I knew you because you were, because before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. And he was the one that said, Lord, I cannot speak. And the Lord said, don't say you can't speak. And because the Lord says that, you know, I'm going to touch your mouth and I'll put my words in your mouth. And so whatever he said, it was God speaking. Imagine your whole life like that, a whole life where you live your life and everything you have to say, you know, is God saying it through you and so forth. And his ministry wasn't this popular ministry where he had this big crowd following him and, you know, he had one friend, Barak, and he said, oh, you seek great things for yourself. And so his whole life was a life of just, you know, serving the Lord, but it wasn't easy. It was suffering. And I don't know about you, I don't like suffering. You know, I remember we were in the ministry. I've been in the ministry now 22 years doing ministry and just serving. I, I remember we were doing outreach after outreach and not seeing hundreds of people get saved. I'm talking about thousands of people going into some of the worst neighborhoods you could ever find, just sharing the gospel. I, I remember one place we went, it was just hundreds and hundreds of people in this room. It was this huge room about five times the size of this room. And it was all these people in there, and, I, and we gave the altar call. I gave the altar call. Everybody came forward. I was like, what in the world is this? And I said, what, did, what in the world did I say? And my wife looked at me and said, you didn't say nothing. God said everything. <laughs> you know, I said, smart Alec. I'm just one, you know. And, but you, just seeing all these, you know, these people come to the Lord, like week after week, or we would plan outreaches. We would have what you all just saw in that video. We would have maybe three of them going on at one time on a Saturday. Just outreach after outreach, people getting saved. And, and then one day I get a call. You know, my wife calls me and she said, honey, that's some news. I said, what's going on? She said, I got cancer. And I'm like saying to myself, well, why in the world did this happen? You know, I said, why? You know, I started thinking, why? You know, you say, why? Why? We serving you, Lord. We love you. We, we're not weird. We're not kooky. We just love to share the gospel. We just, you know, we, we serving you, Lord. I mean, why? And I remember my wife looked at me and said, well, I don't know about why, but what? And I said, wow, how about that? What is God doing? Even in that, what was he doing? You know, what is he doing in our lives when, when, the, when, the, and when the question is why, and God is saying, what? I'm doing something. You want to know what I'm doing? Don't ask why. Because your life is not your life. And our lives are, you know, we're the temples of God. And our whole lives belong to him. And Jeremiah's life was like that. In fact, in Jeremiah 16, God said, don't even get married. Don't get married in this place. Don't get married. He said, you know, and later on you go in Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9. He's like ready to, I'm not speaking for you no more, Lord. And he said it was like fire shut up in his bones. Because he was the message and God was using him, but he wasn't popular. He wasn't popular. He went through the last five kings. He saw Jehoiakim and Jehoahaz and Jehoiachin and Zedekiah. You know, he saw all these kings. None of them were good. And he lived through all that. And he had a message for these kings. And God gave him a message. It's not that they were going to listen and do any of it. But God said, this is the call on your life. 
It's not going to be a revival when you come on the scene, Jeremiah. It's not going to be this, because we always think great stuff is things that people are pleased with. That's not in the Bible. Great stuff sometimes means getting beaten and, you know, like, you know, Paul, he goes to Lystra and get beaten. You know, imagine that. And you would wake up and say, oh, I'm, we would have never said I'm going back in that city. We said, Lord, I quit this ministry. Thanks. But no thanks. You didn't call me to stone and, you know, you called me to sing on the choir and go home and go to heaven. You know, and in the Bible, it knows nothing about that. The Bible knows nothing about anything that was easy. Everything was hard. And so we live in a Western hemisphere where we look at life in such a way like everything should be easy. And, oh, man, look at the crowds. Jeremiah didn't have a crowd. But was he in the center of God's will? Of course he was. He was in the center of God's will, being beaten. He was thrown in a cistern. You imagine getting beaten and, you know, beaten for doing right. <laughs> you know, I'm serving. Kabloom, you know. Hey, Lord, good to, you know, just imagine. And how our lives sometimes, God can put us in the dungeons of life. And that's when we learn more about God. And that's what Jeremiah is going to do. He's going to be in the dungeon, in the crucibles of life, in the cisterns of life. That's when you learn God. That's when you learn something else about God. You thought you knew him? No, Paul is the one who said, as years of walking with the Lord, Paul is the one who said that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and fellowship of his sufferings being conformed into his death. Paul says, I know him, but now I really want to know him. And I think the more we know him, the more we suffer. I think the more you know the Lord, the more you'll suffer like Christ. And I said, well, well, I don't want to know him like that. He said, yeah, I want to know you. But no, I don't want to know you, Lord. And here Jeremiah, you know, he's in this place because I think in the, in, he's in a, a culture where they worship in other gods. The priest was corrupt. The prophets was false. You know, they were worshiping Baal and Moloch. You know, where Moloch, they would offer their kids to the god of Moloch, where they would put their kids on this, this metal statue, light this statue up there red hot, and put their babies on it so the babies would burn to death. And they would beat a drum on the side to drown out the baby's cry. That's how wicked they became. And they knew they should have never worshipped Moloch. It says it in the law. They knew it. And he's dealing with this. He comes on the scene, this young teenager God raises up. And God said, no, 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 before you were formed in the womb, I knew you. I knew what I had for you. I don't think God's goal is for us just to get to heaven. I think God's goal is for all of us sitting here, you know, the Bible says, you know, for whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. I think God's goal for all of us is to be conformed into the image of Christ, not just heaven. Heaven is the bonus. And here Jeremiah is the weeping prophet. You know, he's a weeping prophet, not because he's a wimp. But he's a weeping prophet because he's concerned about the sin of his people. He's, he has the same heart of Christ as Christ had for, you know, Jerusalem, knowing that it would be, you know, the temple would be burned down in, you know, AD 70 by Titus Vespasian. Jesus knew that. Jeremiah knew that the temple that Solomon built would be burned down. He knew, he knew that because these people were saying, we got the temple. Like that was going to save them when the Babylonians came. When Nebu, you know, Nebuchadnezzar would come, and Nebuchadnezzar, and when they would come upon the people, they thought because they had the temple there that they would be saved. And they were saying, you know, some people think, well, I came to church, I'm safe. <laughs> really? You know, and they thought that because of their religious activity that they were all saved. And Jeremiah was dismantling all their belief. Remember when J Jesus was standing outside Jerusalem, he says, oh, Jerusalem, he says, oh, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often? And he said, I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathered chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. You, you weren't even willing. And he says, see, your house is left desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more. He said, you won't even see me no more until you say, bless is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Jeremiah had the same heart. The same thing was cooking in his heart. That, you know, but hey, I got a message 
But are you willing to deliver the message and what comes with the message? You know, how many of us willing to go somewhere and share something and you know they're going to get you, you know, after you get done? You know, I remember we did an outreach one time. They was calling us, threatening us the whole week. They said, you come in and do an outreach if you want to. I wouldn't tell nobody they was threatening us because nobody would have showed up. And we would have, you know, we would have wasted all this money. So, well, we just had to take our chances. <laughs> and I went down there. We got down there and ain't nothing happened. Because the Lord was with me and the Lord was with us. And he's with all of us. And here Jeremiah is before us. And here in verse 1 of chapter 38, I love what it says. It says, Now Shaphatiah, the son of Matan, Gedaliah, the son of Pasher, and Juco, what a name, <laughs> the son of Shalemiah, and Pasher, the son of Melchiah, heard the words that Jeremiah had spoken to all the people, saying, Now these men didn't want to do what Jeremiah had to say, neither did they like his message, but they remembered everything he said. Let me tell you something. When you tell people the truth, they might not necessarily like it, but they'll remember it. And they'll really remember it when it comes to truth. They'll remember it. So these four nobles heard, you know, what Jeremiah was speaking. But this was an indictment against Jeremiah in their eyes. But the real problem was their heart problem because Jeremiah was speaking with thus says the Lord. Their problem was a heart problem because the heart of the matter is always the matter of the heart. And here it says, verse 2, this is Jeremiah's message. Thus says the Lord, he who remains in this city shall die by the sword, by famine, by pestilence. Imagine somebody telling you that. You're going to die by the sword. You stay here. You mean get out of here. Famine, get out. I got plenty of money. What do you mean famine? Pestilence, disease. But he who goes over to the Chaldean shall live. His life shall be a surprise to him, and he shall live. You know, Jeremiah said, if you just cooperate with God's plan, you're already going to get judged. But just go ahead to Babylon. You'll be there for 70 years. We know that in 70 years, we... Um, Daniel was in Babylon, and Daniel chapter 9, he goes to Darius and tells Darius, look, the 70 years that was spoken of of Jeremiah the prophet, quoting Jeremiah chapter 25, the years are completed. The people were set free to go back to their own country. This is all Jeremiah said. If you just submit to the Lord, you're already going to get chastened by God because you guys didn't keep the Sabbath. I'm giving you 70 years for over 490 years. You didn't keep the Sabbath. And here you go. I'm going to send you guys into captivity. But you'll come back to your land one day. Jeremiah will buy property there. He'll come back to the land. He knew the whole script. He knew the whole script. He had the word of God. He knew that Nehemiah would build the walls. And, you know, that he, you know, he since he knew that they would be back, that Ezra would go back. In 458 B.C., he understood all of that. But here's Jeremiah's message. He says that his life shall be as a prize to him, and he shall live. Thus says the Lord, verse 3, this city shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon's army, which shall take it, King Nebuchadnezzar. Because remember, they had these deportations. 605 B.C., they took all the nobles. They took Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That was the first group. By the time you get to 597 B.C., this other group was deported. That would have been the group with Ezekiel, and he was taken 200 miles proper north of Babylon near the river of Chabar. Ezekiel would be taken there. And then ultimately in 586 B.C., they would destroy the city. They would tear down the wall. They would destroy the temple, Solomon's temple. They would destroy it. Jeremiah knew all of that. And you think they want to hear this message? They nobles living good? You know, nice houses, you know, living in the palaces. And you think they want to hear somebody telling them that the city is going to be taken by the Babylonians? They mean, get out of here. What do you mean? They, they didn't want to hear that. It says, therefore, the princes said to the king in verse 4, please let this man, they was cut and dry, be put to death. I don't like your message. Let's kill him. You can kill the messenger, but you'll never kill the message. 
It says, for thus he weakens the hands of the men of war who remain in this city and the hands of all the people by speaking such words to them. For this man does not seek the welfare of this people, but their harm. Then Zedekiah king said, look, he, speaking of Jeremiah, is in your hands, for the king can do nothing against you. Now listen to what's going on here. He said that he is in your hands. Let me tell you something. We are in nobody's hands but the Lord. I don't care what anybody say. My life is the Lord's. And your life is the Lord's. And he owns us. We're his property. And I think Zedekiah had it all wrong. He says that, oh, no, you know, his hand is in, and he's in your hand. No, no, no. He was in the hand of the Lord because before he was born, God knew him and ordained him. And installed him and appointed him to be prophet. So how was his hand in anybody's hands but the Lord's hands? Even wherever we go in our life, you know, he said, well, you know, my boss is this, my boss is that at work and this. No, we're in the Lord's hands. We work for Jesus even at the workplace. I say you work for, who you work for? Jesus. I don't know, that's kind of bad for some people because Jesus watched that time clock too, you know. When you say, hey. Hit my clock. I'm on my way. I'm not there yet. <laughs> Jesus sees that too. And we work for the Lord. So Zedekiah tells these angry princes to do whatever you want to do with Jeremiah, the Lord's prophet. And little do you know that Jeremiah's life was not in his hands, but in the Lord's hands. And our lives are too. Remember in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 19, when it says, They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you. For I am with you, says the Lord, to deliver you. Isn't that interesting? That God is with us. You know, the Bible says he'll never leave us nor forsake us. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 8. Joshua 1.5, 1 Chronicles 28.20, you know, Hebrews 13.5. All through the Bible, it says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'll, I'll never. So when somebody says, hey, you know, hey, they just got news and you got cancer. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. You just got laid off from your job. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. You just lost all your money in the stock market. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Your kids that you raised in the church, you thought they were going to grow up and be godly kids. They're just prodigals and they are scoundrels now. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And that's who God is. And so it's not based off our circumstances who God is God. The Bible says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God, who we serve, changes not. He's immutable. Amen. And our lives sometimes are governed by how we see life and our situations and our circumstances. And then circumstances, we look at God and say, oh, man, this can't be the same God here in this situation that was over there. The God just gave me a new house. I'm on closing. I got the land I wanted. That's the God I know. Oh, the God went, oh, the house caught on fire. That can't be God. Oh, he's the same God. He's the same God. So we have the life of Jeremiah before us. You know, and he's in the dungeon. He's going to get thrown in the dungeon. You know, the dungeons is a place of darkness. It's a place of dampness, coldness. It's a place where you holler, nobody can hear you. I'm down here, 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 here. They don't hear you. The dungeons of life, none of us like being in the cisterns of life. Cold. Loneliness. You have a sense of forsaken, being forsaken by God. A sense of, you know, God don't care about what I'm going through. He don't understand. If he understood, he would do something right now. I don't know how you can be God and not do something right now. I like when God does stuff right away. I'm a wimp, you know. I get a call. Oh, Lord, help me today. Because <laughs> I'm your servant. I don't want to miss days serving you. And no, no, no. He makes us lie down. We don't want to lie. I don't want to just serve some. I want to just do, 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 do. But here he's in a dungeon. He was in a dungeon before. Jeremiah's going to get thrown in a dungeon. He was in the dungeon at Jonathan's house. You know, in this same chapter, later on in verse 20, he said, I want to go back to the dungeon in Jonathan's house. You know, in chapter 37, verse 15, he was in a dungeon before. He knows what it is like to be in a dungeon, but this dungeon is different. It's a different dungeon. 
We can go from one dungeon to the next dungeon where everything just seems closed down in our lives. Everything. And the Lord says, no, I'm with you in the dungeon. He says, no, you're not. I'm praying and nothing happening. I'm here with you in the dungeon. I've been crying for years for this kid to come back home. And he hasn't come back yet. I'm with you in the dungeon still. And he doesn't come when we always want him to come. He comes when he wants to and is always on time. And here's Jeremiah in verse 30, I mean, verse 6 of chapter 38. It says, so they took Jeremiah and cast. That means to throw or to, to, to fling, to hurl, to throw, to hurl him. You know, they, says, they took Jeremiah and cast him into the dungeon of Malchiah, the king's son. Isn't that something? Which was in the court of the prison, and they let Jeremiah down with ropes. So they needed to let him down with ropes. You know what that meant? It was deep. It was deep. You know those manholes you see in the city? And they just lower, you know, guys get lowered down. He's getting lowered down, lowered down with rope. And in the dungeon there was no water, but mire, this muddy, swampy place. So Jeremiah sank in the mud. Flavius Josephus, the, Jew, the Jewish historian, says that the mud came up to his nose. I don't know how he found that out. Maybe he knew somebody who talked to Jeremiah. But the mud came up to his nose. Could you imagine you and then trying to get up, you know, a, 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 a mud bath, not by design, but you in the mud? And you got your head up like this so you won't suffocate? You know, because in the mud and in the, in the cisterns of life, it almost feels like you're suffocating sometimes. It always feels like you're just running out of gas. You're just running out of everything. You can picture the cistern of life, the, the coldness of life, the, the darkness, the stress, the weariness, loneliness, the hurt, all the pain. Some of the things we see in this world we live in, social media is good, but it's bad, too. Because some information, we get too much information, too fast, and it makes you just think about everything. And here, Jeremiah is in a place where I'm sure that he's thinking, I've been your servant, Lord. I've been doing everything you tell me to do. My message has been the message that you've given me. I've never deviated from anything you wanted me to do, Lord. And why do I have to be an assistant? Why do I have to be the one who gets lowered down in this place of mud and this place of distress and darkness and emptiness? Why me, Lord? I'm not doing anything but what you want me to do. We often think that nothing should happen just because we serve in the Lord. That is not true. That is not true. And by the time Jeremiah gets to, you know, he writes the book of Lamentations. He writes this, and it's almost written in like a dirge. A dirge is a funeral song. He writes Lamentations in Hebrew acrostic poetry, almost like Psalm 119. He writes this dirge. But when you get to Lamentations chapter, you know, 3 verse 55, you don't have to turn to this, but Jeremiah says this in Lamentations chapter 3 verse 55, I called on your name, O Lord, from the lowest pit. You have heard my voice. Do not hide your ear from my sighing, from my cry for help. You draw near on the day I called on you and said, do not fear. Was the Lord speaking to him down in that cistern? Did he hear the quiet, still voice of the Lord in that place and said, do not fear. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. I love you. I'm going to help you. I love you. You're still my prophet. You're still called by me. You're still chosen by me. Don't think God is not, you know, has just thrown us out with the bath water because life is bad. It's not the God we serve. And here Jeremiah is in this place. I love what the psalmist prayed in Psalm, you know, on 69, 13 and 14 when he says, But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, in the acceptable time. O God, in the multitude of your mercy, hear me in the truth of your salvation. Deliver me out of the mire and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from those who hate me and out of the deep waters. We should not have prayed like that. 
So Jeremiah is in this cold, damp, dark cistern, and there he cries out to the Lord. You know, the psalmist wrote, Hear my cry, O God, attended unto my prayer. From the ends of the earth I will cry to you. When my heart is overwhelmed within me, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Lead me, Lord. Because when everything else failed, I know you're faithful. I know you are my strength. Remember that song, Rock or Ages, you know, class for me, Let Me Hide Myself in Thee. You are the rock of ages. And we can say, Lord, lead me. Lead me. Guide me. Guide me. There's no shortcuts in this life. Some courses may seem like electives until you get deeper in them. No, they're mandatory. Some courses are mandatory. You say, Lord, I don't want that. I just want to take the music class and the ballet classes and the pottery classes. I don't want no algebra or no trigonometry or no physics. I don't want none of that stuff. Just let me have stuff I like. It's not like that. It is not like that in the life we live in as believers. It is not like that. There's some courses we have to go on, and the trajectory that God takes our lives and the courses that we're on, sometimes, Lord, I don't want, I don't want nothing to do with that. I don't want no hardship. Anybody wake up in the morning and say, Lord, you know what I was just wondering? When are you going to give me some hardship? <laughs> I'll never say that. Nobody walks around and says, you know what, I was just thinking, if I could just get persecuted a little bit more. <laughs> I'm not thinking like that. I'm, 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 I'm not. I don't want no problems. And make it easy. I want to just preach, evangelize, die, and go to heaven and say, praise the Lord. But that ain't going to happen like that. It's not going to happen like that. So Jeremiah is in a cistern. And you may be in one today yourself. You may be in a dungeon. Nobody knows it. Because you're not telling anybody about it. You don't even want to tell nobody about it. Because they wouldn't understand first. They wouldn't understand that you're in this place of distress, deep darkness. You may leave it, get in your car and say, you know what? That pastor, he didn't know my circumstances. But you know what? Somehow the Lord was speaking to me through Jeremiah. Somewhere I am going through stuff. And I don't want to tell nobody because I want to make myself look normal to everybody and happy all the time. You mean the average Christian, how you doing? Blessed by the, praise the Lord. How's everything? Great, great. And then you leave out right from everybody and say, no, it's not, it's miserable. They only can see me from the inside out. They would weep for me. They would pray for me. If somebody just saw my heart, they would just melt. You know, if somebody's seen all the things that I'm struggling with. And we are people that like to hide. And here, these pages, God makes it clear that this man was a prophet, loved by God, beloved by God, the weeping prophet. They had the heart of God. And yet, God still allows him to be lowered into that cistern. And we think that's the end of the story. So I'm loaded in this place. And that's it. Every time we're in those places, God will always send help. But it won't be from where we think it's going to come from. We, you know, you ever try to call somebody when stuff's going on in your life and nobody answers? Because God said, I don't want them involved with it. I don't want them involved with it. You want them involved with it. And God said, no, no, no. I have another course i have another group i have another thought pattern to help you with this and it won't be people we choose it won't be people we choose you ever been going through something some stranger walk up to you you know i'm just really praying for you i'm like how did they know i was going through something or somebody said something and he said well how did they know that because the lord uses who he wants to use jeremiah would have never thought of this man that god is going to use in the next verse it says that now Ebek Malik, Ebek Malik, what a name. You know what his name means? Servant of the king. Could you imagine every time somebody called you, servant of the king, servant of the king, servant of the, servant of the, come on, you know, servant of the king. And he was a, an Ethiopian eunuch. He was a eunuch, one of the eunuchs who was in the king's house, heard that they had put Jeremiah well, the king was sitting at the gate of Benjamin. Now here, this eunuch here, you know, you knew that they were in trouble because eunuchs, according to the law, 
was excluded from public worship in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 1. You know, at this point in history, Judah started taking on all the pagan nation's practices and was letting Eunice in the temple courts and the temple precincts and all that. They weren't even supposed to be there. They got them hired working in the, t in, in the temple area. And here God will use somebody that shouldn't be somewhere for the purpose of what he's going to use them for. This man shouldn't even have been there. And here he has enough heart. It says who was, he was a Cushite, a Gentile, who was in the king's house. We says, heard that they had put Jeremiah in the dungeon. When the king was sitting at the gate of Benjamin, verse 8, Epic Malik went out of the king's house and spoke to the king, saying, Now, I believe that he may have read something in the Bible. I believe he may have had a scroll that he read. And this man, this eunuch name is right in the pages of scriptures. And the Bible talks a lot about eunuchs. You know, the Ethiopian eunuch in, you know, in Acts, you know, that was the chamberlain of for Candace the queen. He carried all her money and so forth. Here, this eunuch, I believe he read Isaiah chapter 56 when it says, you have to turn as I read it. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, and choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant, even to them I will give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. I think he must have read Isaiah. And he knew the Lord was because he recognized that Jeremiah was God's servant. And he recognized that Jeremiah was the spokesperson for God, his prophet. And somehow he just didn't sit around and say, well, look, I'm not even from here. What I'm worried about him being in a dungeon. I'm, look, I'm just a slave. He didn't do that. Because you're either in the dungeon or you should be somebody to help somebody out of the dungeon. That's the principle. And here it says that, he says, my Lord, the king, and he goes to the king. How many people would have a heart to go to the king? He says, these men have done evil. This man was not afraid to call evil, evil, and he was not trying to be politically correct. It's a problem, big problem. He comes to the city gate when the king may have been conducting official business there. And then Zedekiah, who was evil, he comes right to him and says, My lord, the king, these men have done evil in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they have cast into the dungeon, and he is likely to die from hunger in the place where he is, for there is no more bread in the city. The city was a mess anyway. You know what happens to Zedekiah. Zedekiah is the one who they prophesied and said, he'll be taken to Babylon but not see it. You remember? And he tried to run out at nighttime and they caught him and took him to Ribla. Ribla was a bad place to go when you was facing Nebuchadnezzar because Ribla was a place of judgment. And he took them, Zedekiah right out there and they gouged his eyes out, took him into Babylon. He went to Babylon and never saw it because he was blind when he got there and he died there. That Zedekiah, that's who they're talking about here, Zedekiah. And he says that, Zedekiah, you let these men do evil. We should never sit back and let evil be evil and not say nothing. We should never be those who are afraid to stand in the gap and, say, and speak up against evil. And here this man saying, no, you have done God's servant wrong. And I got a problem with that. And it says in verse 10, then the king commanded, and this is the same king that said, throw him in there and do whatever you want to do. Look how he's vacillating. Then the king commanded, Epic Malik, the Ethiopian, saying, take from here 30 men with you and lift Jeremiah the prophet. He recognized that Jeremiah is the prophet because it says, lift Jeremiah the prophet out of the dungeon before he dies. He recognizes that Jeremiah is a prophet. And then he says, you know, so he won't die. In verse 12, then Epic Malik, the Ethiopian, said to Jeremiah, Jeremiah is over 60 years old, right? He's an older man now. He's not a kid anymore. He's about 60 years of age. Please put these old clothes and rags under your armpits, under the ropes. And Jeremiah did so because this is remarkable. He throws the ropes down. He says, I don't want to mess up his arms. Get some rags and some cushion. I'm going to pull you right on out. We should be the ones roping people up. You see them down, don't just walk by them and like, oh, that's on them. They should have been at church three Sundays in a row. I didn't see them in a month. That's on them. You probably need to repent. We shouldn't be those kind of people. 
Oh, we see somebody we're looking at, you know, the church look, you get that looking, where you been? <laughs> well, I've been, uh, where? You know, we do that, we do that. And the people look like, oh my God, I should have never came near that church. The way they were looking at me, like I'm a criminal or something. And here it says that this man pulled him out. I'm telling you, you either in the dungeon, or you somebody helping pull somebody to the dungeon. Which one are you? And when you get out of the dungeon, get your rope ready because you're going to have to help somebody else out. You're going to have to help them out. You're going to have to help them out. We are one body. When one person hurts, the whole body hurts. And here, Jeremiah, I could imagine, he would have never thought in a million years that this epic Malik guy would have been the one to say, hey, let's get this guy out of here. He would have never thought that in a million years. Sometimes God sent help from unlikely sources and unlikely places. We would never ever think that. We would never ever think that. We would always think that it got to be somebody we're familiar with. That's not how God works. That's not how it works. And Jeremiah, Jeremiah needed kindness when he was in the dungeon and in the mire. Not nobody criticizing him. Not nobody looking down there and saying, we'll pull you up, but tell us what really happened. Tell us the truth. How'd you really get down there? Oh, come on, you didn't do nothing. Sure, you was just preaching for the Lord. That's what we'd have done. We said, we'll let you out. Look, you don't have to pay for this, buddy. Like some people, the guy said he had a son. His son went away from him and just was living any kind of way. And his son came home. He said, oh, yeah, you can come home. But the rules change. That's the way we are. But here Jeremiah is in this place, and kindness is being shown to him from the Lord. You know, Andrew Bonner, a Scottish preacher, I love him. He said, if, we're going, if we are growing holier, we are growing kinder. Part of growing in holiness, you become kinder. You're not holy if you're a mean person. I'm telling you that now. I don't care what you say. You're not. How you doing? I'm just fine. How's everything going? None of your business. You know, that's not, you know, no. You grow kinder as you grow holier. And it says in verse 13, so they pulled Jeremiah up with ropes and lifted him out of the dungeon, and Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. And, you know, are you one who's pulling people out? Or are you one in the dungeon? God uses both. He uses both. He uses both. He uses the, the epic Maliks of the year of the, of, of, of the world, and he uses the Jeremiahs of the world. Jeremiah means Jehovah is high, or Jehovah is exalted. He uses the Jeremiahs and the epic Maliks, the servants of, the God, of God, or the king, and he uses those who are, belong to him, and he puts in high places. He uses both. But he knows what he's doing. Don't think God don't know what he's doing. He knows what he's doing if you're in the pit today. He knows what he's doing. All things work together for the good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. They all work together for the good. And this man here, you know, it's amazing that, you know, Epic Malik, I'm sure he just said this is just the do, this is the right thing to do. He didn't know that God would have promises for his life for doing a good deed, for showing kindness. He would have never known that. Look at Jeremiah chapter 39, verse 15. I love this. It says, Meanwhile, the word of the Lord had come to Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the prison, saying, Go and speak to Epic Malik, the Ethiopian, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring my words upon the city for adversity and not for good, and they shall be performed in that day before you. But, and this is in connection with Epic Malik, I will deliver you in that day. And the word deliver is the same word used in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 19, when God said, I will deliver you, Jeremiah. The same word is applied to Epic Malik. He says, but I will deliver you in that day, says the Lord, and you shall not be given into the hand of the men of whom you are afraid. For I will surely, and this is emphatic, deliver you and you shall not fall by the sword, but your life shall be as a prize to you because you have put your trust in me, says the Lord. God delivered Epic Malik when the Babylonians would come. 
Not because he helped Jeremiah, but because he put his trust in the Lord. He put his trust in the Lord. It says, trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not towards thy own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Plural, he'll direct your paths. Lean not towards your own understanding. That's our problem. We like to understand everything. Some things you can't understand. Some things are beyond our understanding. But God, you're in the crucibles of life today. I always love what it says in Psalm 40, verse 2. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay. I'm sure Jeremiah loved this. And set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. Amen. God does it. You know, one writer wrote this. He says, though the pit seems dark and deep, and my troubles are perplexed. Though I seem to be alone and my soul is vexed, you have not hidden from me, nor have you forgotten me. You're just shaping and molding me because you are the potter and I am the clay. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? That he never hides from us, he have not forgotten us. We think God can forget, he can't forget. He chooses to forget our sins. He says, remember them no more. But he don't forget us. He remembered. Remember Hannah was praying. And, says, and he remembered. And he knows all of us in here. One by one. If you're in that mud. You know, I, sometimes the mud be right here with me. I'm like, God, help me, Lord, please. Calgon, take me away or something. <laughs> and I'm like, I want it over with now, Lord. He says, nope, not yet. But, Lord, right now it would be good if you get me out of this now. And I said, nope, because it's something I want to change in you. And part of it is I want you to trust me even more the next time. You know, I always think about throughout the Bible, you know, they go through stuff like, remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were thrown into the fire furnace. You know, and it's just they were in there, and they said, even if our God don't deliver us, we're not bowing down. And then King Nebuchadnezzar, he says, oh, man, I threw three in the fire, and now there's four, and the fourth one is the son of God. God reveals himself to sinners when we make stands. When we make stands. And could you imagine Jeremiah, his whole life, 41 years plus of ministry or so, his whole life was marked out by God. His whole life, God chose him in himself before the foundation of the world. His whole life was marked out by God. And those are trials, tribulations, times of joy, times of happiness, times of sorrow. That's all part of life. It can't just be one way. We will never know God. We'll never know God. We'll never appreciate God when everything is good. We'll start complaining when everything is good. You ever heard somebody say, I want a brand new car. They get a brand new car. Mm, that leather smells so good. They drive it. Three months later, man, this car note is killing me. I should have never got it. We never satisfied people. And the worst, the worst place to be is the thing you want most that you think will satisfy. And when you get it, it's dissatisfying. But Jesus will always satisfy and here our prophet is for us right here today. When we're in the dungeons of life, God is right there with us. And he'll always send help. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray for